We're going to be in 1 John this morning. You can turn there. But before that, uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple things. Um, Contemplating over the course of preparing for this sermon this morning, it's just some of the places that I go to when I want satisfaction or I want to find life or I want to find uh, joy. One of those things is skiing. And if you guys know me well, you know that I love skiing. You know that uh, if you've skied with me, you know that one of my desires is to learn how to do a 360. I cannot do it yet. I've failed time and time again. Uh, I just can't get myself to do it. Um, and so then when I fail, skiing becomes kind of unfun for me, right? It just becomes one of those things that's like, wow, well, I'm just going to go home, right? So something that I love ends up letting me down. Um, we're kind of in this New Year phase, and I'm sure we've all made our resolutions. How many have done really good at keeping those so far? No one's raising their hand. That's awesome. Uh, I also have not done well at keeping mine. Uh, I remember back in 2016, there was a few of us uh, kind of started off jokingly talking about getting in shape, and we're like, you know what? It's 2016. Six pack, 16. Here we come. You might be very surprised this morning, but I still don't have one. Um, And I don't know if I ever will, and that's totally fine. It doesn't matter. (laughs) But we fail, right? We, We set out to do stuff. We might succeed. We might find fulfillment. We might find joy. And then we end up failing. Well, this morning, we're going to look at someone who works in us and through us regardless of our failure. And his name is Jesus. Because he is life. He is the source of life. He is holy. And his holiness is put on us through his work on the cross. And he continues to work in us. Um, I love fishing. That's another thing that I love to do. I find a lot of joy in it, a lot of fulfillment. Uh, I was talking to somebody in the foyer about a secret spot that they had, and I said, well, you know what? I'm going to be actually talking this morning about a secret spot that I have. And it's secret, so I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I'm going to tell you how good it is so that you might want to know, and I still won't tell you, but that's the, that's the code and with fishermen, right? We get our spots, and we might let a few people in on that, and that's it. We leave it there. Um, but there is a spot, and a waterfall flows into it, and at the bottom of that waterfall is tons and tons of life. There's life everywhere. The trees are greenest right next to where that waterfall is flowing in. Right? The animals are everywhere. The birds are chirping. They're feeding. And most significantly of all, the fish underneath, right at the bottom of that waterfall, are plenty. And they're big and they're thick and they're colorful and they're healthy because they spend all day long just feeding on the, on, on the food that gets stirred up constantly by this water that's pouring in there. And the first time I went there, I just I saw this and I was like, this place is awesome. I cannot tell anybody about it. <laughs> Right Now, just to come out of this for a second, please tell people about Jesus, okay? Because he is awesome and he is the source of life. That's where we're going. You need to tell them about this, but not secret fishing spots, okay? Um, first time I cast, fish on. Second time, bite. Third time, fish on. Like, we, you're just catching fish left, right, and center. Like, this place is awesome. There's an abundance of life in this spot. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the fact that Jesus is our source of life, okay? We're, that's where we're going. So in First John, uh, we've been taking the youth and the young adults very slowly through this. It's a short book, but it is packed with, with goodness. It is packed with truth. Uh, and we've been looking, we've been unpacking these truths. We've been looking at Jesus, uh, the fact that he's light, that he's love, that he's light, and that in all of these things, they work together in our salvation. And most recently, we've been looking at the fact that Jesus continues to work in us. Right? His redeeming work on the cross. He's risen again, and we put our faith in him. He continues to work in us. He continues to, to go to bat for us. He continues to lead us. So this morning in First John, we're going to read all of chapter 1, and we're going to kind of peek into chapter 2 a little bit as well. So here we go. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Talking about Jesus. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. 
and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So there's a couple observations that we need to make here uh, in this chunk of scripture this morning. Five to be exact. I could have been nice and just gave you a three-point sermon, but I'm going for five. Uh, because I want us to, to see something here. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at the fact that Jesus is eternal. We're going to look at the fact that Jesus has made himself known to us. We're going to look that, at the fact that Jesus is the restorer of relationship and fellowship. We're going, to be, we're going to see that he is light, and finally we're going to see that he is our advocate, which is, has a ton of implications in how we live our day-to-day lives. And all of those things need to point to this truth that true, death-defeating, sin-forgiving, relationship-restoring, trial-enduring, grace and mercy-infused life is only found in Jesus. It's only found in Jesus. We can't, shouldn't go anywhere else. Right? And we're going to apply that later by being obedient in our abiding in Jesus, right? It's one of John's big things that he likes to talk about is we need to abide in that life. So we'll get there. Number one, Jesus is eternal. That which was from the beginning. You read that and you say the beginning of what? Well, firstly, I guess, the beginning of his life, right? He comes to this earth. He makes himself known. But even more importantly, and solidifying this even more, it's so significant that Jesus has always been, right? Beginning of time, before time. Jesus is God, right? Again, we, we're just worshiping this triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is part of that, right? Jesus has always been. He's been from the beginning of creation, right? He says, before Abraham was, I am. This is uh, a saying that was terribly upsetting to the leaders of the time, right? Who, what is he saying? He's saying he's God? That's exactly right. Genesis 1, 26 says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, right? Let us make man in our image in our likeness, right? I love, I love the word usage there, right? Stating that Jesus is there in creation, speaking life into that which he created. John 1, not First John, but John 1, 1 to 5 says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It's pretty clearly spelled out for us. All things are made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. See what John's doing here now in 1 John? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then you skip down to verse 14, and it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's Jesus. That's who we're talking about. So what does this say about life? Well, it says that Jesus was from the beginning. Jesus is life. Therefore, life has been from the beginning. But Tyler, you just read in Genesis that God created, right? Well, it's true. God created, right? God created animals and, and the mountains and all things that have life. But he breathed life into those things, right? Life didn't come from matter. Matter came from life. God breathed that in. Right? He is life. He's the source. And so he's the one who gives it. So this is the Jesus we're looking at. Jesus from the beginning, there at creation, who is life and who is the giver of life. And so then you jump down to verse 2 in 1 John, and, it, and then it starts talking about this eternal life, right? the spiritual end of this. 
what we get by putting our, our faith and our trust in the Son. Jesus was made known to us, right? So he's eternal. And secondly, Jesus was made known to us. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our eyes concerning, or our hands rather, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it, right? He was made known to us. Jesus is the word and the word came to make known to us the plan of redemption and not just to make it known but to carry it through. He came to fulfill this plan of redeeming us to the Father and saving us from sin. And without his coming, we don't have salvation at all. So what about the life that Jesus actually lived you know, those 30 plus years that he was on this earth, right? He is life and, and he came and he lived a physical life here on this earth amongst his people. One, have heard, have seen, have looked at and touched. Verse two, have seen, testify and proclaim. Verse three, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. John is getting a point across like we observe Jesus, right? We observed him. We gazed at him. It says looked upon, right? It's really what it means is gaze, like in the same way that you would sit in a theater and just gaze at what's going on on the stage, right? John is saying, I spent years just gazing at Jesus, looking upon Jesus, being with him, seeing who he is, how he's working, right? And so that's our, that's our first, that's my first for myself, sort of application here. How much do I just spend gazing at Jesus? How much time do I devote to just looking at him and, and just soaking him up? Am I abiding in him as, as this vegetation by this waterfall is green and its roots go deep? Am I like that fish who just spends all day long just feeding on what's getting stirred up by that water, never leaving because that fish knows where the source of life is? Are we like that? That's the first challenge. John hammers on a point of abiding here later on throughout the rest of the letter, but it starts right here with him and his own application of that, right? And that's why he sees the significance of it. And in John, I think 15, 16, right? Jesus is saying, like, you need to abide in me, right? Abide in the source. Let your roots go to the source, right? And John sees that and he lived it out and, and he understands the implications of that. And so he, he wants us to see it. Uh, a number of, I guess it's maybe even months ago, uh, a bunch of guys sitting around having a meeting, uh, talking about some maybe not easy things, right? This world throws hard things at us. And this, this verse of scripture was brought to us and it's just stuck with me from then till now and even just helped me prepare for the sermon. And it's found in Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah 17. And it says this, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. And there's four things that I observe in this short passage. Number one, we're called to trust in God. Number two, that if we are drawn to the source, when everything else burns up and dries up around us and is crumbling and our lives are falling apart, we will remain green and remain bearing fruit because we're linked to the source. Right? And it's just, like, it's just like Jesus saying, build your house on the rock when the storms come, not if. Right? The light, life is just going to throw a bunch of stuff at you. I mean, we just finished praying for several families who are going through trial right now. I know some of your stories, you're, you're just going through continuous trials, years. And as those months and years stack on top of each other, it doesn't get any easier. But what's being said here and what Jesus himself said and what John is saying is that we need to let our roots go deep into the stream of life that is Jesus because the storm and the drought is coming. Right? The drought is coming. Number three here, there's this little note of not being anxious, right? The leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought because we can get pretty caught up emotionally when the stuff kind of hits the fan, right? Like, we're like, whew, 
and we get anxious about it. And anxiety is a huge, huge thing, and it's very real. But we're being drawn here to Jesus, saying that he will give you peace through that. And then finally, it says you're going to bear fruit. Right? What does a good tree do? A good fruit tree, anyways, bears fruit. Right? Jesus used this, uses this illustration. A good tree bears fruit, even in the hardest times. Right? C.S. Lewis says this, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. There is no other. I love the, the pictures that, that he often drew up and used to get his point across, right? It, there's nothing else that satisfies, nothing else that we can run on properly, although we might try to fill it with a whole bunch of other stuff. We're putting the wrong fuel in our engines, right? We're putting the wrong fuel in, and it might work for a little while, and then all of a sudden we stall out, and we're hurting, right? It's letting us down. Jesus himself is, is that in which we need to be fueled by. 1 John 5, right? So we're in chapter 1, you skip ahead to the end. says this in verse 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. Right? God gave it. He sent a son. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. It's simple. You either have Jesus or you don't. You either have life or you don't. Life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was from the Father and was made manifest to us. So in Jesus, we find life for living in a burning up and dry and dangerous world, right? It is. I mean, Vernon's pretty good, although in the summer it literally does dry up and burn. But, you know, our world, figuratively speaking, I mean, it is, it's falling apart, right? It's been falling apart since the fall of man, but we have the source. We have the ticket, right? We have the freedom. Eternal life is not just spending eternity with Jesus, but that is that spiritual life that can have fulfillment right here on this earth, right, with him. It's only found in Christ. There's a, an awesome program on Netflix. I think it's actually a BBC program or something. I'm not 100% sure. But uh, it's on Netflix. I had to rewatch it a couple times. It's Planet Earth, right? You guys watched Planet Earth before? And Planet Earth 2, even better. Like, better quality. Better produced. It's really nice. Um, this show is awesome. Like, it just goes all over the world, shows a bunch of different habitats and environments and all the life that's in it, right? And it's especially great for the Christian watching it because you know who created it all. Right? And it's like, God bless the ones that bought the cameras to go and do that. That is just so sweet. They might not even be realizing it, right? So we're sitting there, and we're watching it as a family. And all of a sudden, I think it's in the desert ones. And it, you know, I can't even remember what desert it is, to be honest. But there's these little black beetles, right? Tiny little things. And every single morning, they wake up come out of the dirt, out of the sand, the fine sand, and they climb up this massive sand dune, which would be the equivalent of two Mount Everest for you or I to walk up, which would be very hard to do every single day. Impossible, right? But that's, that's the picture that's being drawn here. Um, so this beetle wakes up every single day, climbs up to the top of the sand dune, kind of puts its head down, the rest of his body up in the air, and just collects the morning mist. And all this water settles on the body of this beetle, and God designed this beetle to have these little sort of grooves in its body that kind of help funnel all the water down to its mouth so it can drink. And every single morning it does this. Every single morning it seeks out this, this life of water, right? Without it, it would die. If this thing missed one day, it would die, right? Now, at the top, it's not safe, right? Because waiting are these very hungry lizards, Right? And they're sitting there, and they know that every single day if they show up, the beetles are showing up to get water, so they're going to have some food. Right? It's kind of a neat little trickle effect. Right? But the point here is, like, are we willing 
to be obedient to this end? Are we willing to abide? Right? It takes, it takes obedience. The gift is free. But like last week we looked at in Pastor Dave's sermon, like it's a free gift, but we got to be obedient. We got to take the gift. We got to use the gift. We got to unwrap it. Right? He's given us a spirit. He's given us himself. We got to surrender to that. We got to abide every single day in him. So one, he's eternal, which means he's life. Number two, he makes himself known to us. Thirdly, he is the restorer of relationship and fellowship. So number one, he's the restorer of the relationship between God and man. And secondly, the restorer of this relationship right here. Mine and yours and you and your wives and brothers and sisters and just the day-to-day human relationships that we have. Right? He, can, he has the ability to restore those because we know that they can break, don't we? They can break. The life was made manifest, and this is verse 2 and 3. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. So the fellowship with the Father produces the right fellowship with one another and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So in the beginning, Adam and Eve were created. He's got Adam and Eve and God, right? And the relationship is good. And in the cool of the evening, they walk with the Father in the garden. Like, what a picture, right? Sin enters the scene and ruins it for a long, long, long time. God institutes, right, these laws and and these sacrificial system and these ways that, that people can be made right by him, Right? And, and, and then there's just years and years of brokenness and then Jesus steps onto the scene. Right? He comes, he makes himself known and he restores it. The restorative work of the cross restores us to God. And he doesn't stay dead, he, he raises again. Right? In that new life. And he gives us that life. Now, interestingly enough, one of the first notable things that happens after sin enters the scene, one of the first big sin stories that we read is between two what? Brothers. Right? Cain and Abel. One kills the other. Like, right out of the gates. Here we go. Right? And forever we have this, this problem of glorifying God with how we interact with one another. Right? And these are brothers. The church is important. And that's a whole another sermon. There's a lot of different sermons in here. But the church is important, right? It's his bride. He loves the church. He loves this, what's going on right here. He loves what happens in your small groups and in your interactions with him. When you have people over to your, to your home, right? He wants to see that be a healthy thing and honor and glorify God because together can make massive impact in our world and in our community, right? And, and he uses people to do this. It's amazing. There's this phrase that's kind of been rattling around in my, in my mind the last year or so. If God can restore us to him, don't you think that he can restore you to the next person? Like, if God can restore me to the Father, which is a massive deal because I deserve hell, right? I don't even deserve to be in the presence of a holy God. If he can do that and put his righteousness on me, don't you think that he can fix the relationship problems that you have in your own life? And maybe there's something here this morning that you've just been holding on to for 10 plus years, 20 years, who knows what it is, right? Maybe there's just something that is just gripping you and it's never been dealt with, it's never been restored. God has the power to do that. He has the power to restore it because he did something far more significant by restoring you to him. Number four, Jesus is light, right? God is light. Five to nine, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's look at five and six first. This is 
This is the message we have heard from him, right? Jesus declares it. John's saying he's made himself know, known, and he comes to fulfill this plan, and he's saying when he's here, I'm proclaiming God is light, right? God is light. He's proclaiming it, and up, upon that declaration, then we get the chance to declare it, right? We get the chance to, to proclaim that to others. We get the chance to have his light shine through us, right? We need to be image and, and light bearers in our every single day activities, right? In, in the interactions we have, in the reactions we have, and we just, we're just talking about relationships, right? Because he is light, he can shine through us. Verse 5, still, God is light. So he is perfect, he is holy. In him is no darkness at all. In case we had any doubt, right? John is kind of hammering this. It's, he does this sometimes. It's like this cyclical kind of writing style. And he does it because he wants to just make points, right? He wants it to just sink in, right? God is love, God is light, God is life, talk about some other stuff and come back to it, right? Talk about some other stuff and come back to it. He talks about abiding. He talks about walking the light. He talks about the relationship between one another, right? And it's only five, it's only five chapters, yet he repeats himself a lot because it's important for us to understand this. It's an, an important to understand that God is holy. Verse six, if we say we have fellowship, so if we, if we identify with what takes place in the first four verses, right? if we identify and accept the restorative work of Jesus on the cross, but choose to walk in a different way, choose to walk in darkness, we're fooling ourselves, and John is basically saying it's not possible. Right? You can't identify as that and, and just completely walk the other way, right? So really... What we're talking about here is not necessarily the, the struggling Christian that, that's going to face temptation and going to face struggle. Like we're just talking about just outright darkness, just walking, continuously walking away without any desire for repentance, right? And he's warning against it. And John will use this later on as a launching pad um, for discussing, you know, warning against false teaching and uprising of different antichrists that come up within the church of that time and this Gnostic movement of, of these individuals coming up, right, and, and proclaiming that they know all this truth, but what they're proclaiming isn't Christ, and right? It's not Jesus. Right? That's a, again, that's a whole other thing. But he's trying to, trying to get that across John is writing this to the believers as to recalibrate, right? To remember Jesus, to resolve that 2018 resolution. Recalibrate your minds and hearts to who Jesus is, right? Remember that in him is light. Remember that, that in him is the source of life and you need to walk that way. Verse seven to nine. <coughs> But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Right? The truth is not in you. Like, doesn't sound like a, like a saved person. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if you skim over this, and I never encourage you to skim read scripture. You gotta read it carefully, right? But if you were to just read this quickly, it could almost sound like our actions and our obediences and, and or not will determine our salvation, which is in the gospel. It's not about us, right? By our standards, like we're going to hell. Jesus comes and said, it's about me and my holiness and I'm gonna pour that on you, right? So it's not about us. It's the contrary. John is saying, look at Jesus. He's from the beginning. He is life. He is eternal. He came to restore us by way of the cross. And if you accept this and are saved, then you're going to walk like it. Right? The truth is in the pudding. So our love for Jesus should fuel our actions. Right? In that same, that same language that, that C.S. Lewis is using. Like, if we're engines, right, our fuel is Jesus. And so that's got to determine then the course of where that vehicle goes. So yes, there is a weight, however, to what we do. And not in the means that, you know, what we do or don't do either qualifies us or disqualifies us, but rather that we're image bearers, that we should want to be recognized for the one who's inside of us. Right? We, we should want to be recognized as someone who Jesus has restored. And we should want that. We should welcome that. 
He's faithful to forgive and to cleanse. So part of Christ's nature is that he's life, and part of that life is that he produces light. Right? And what does light do? When I think of light, I think of kind of two things all the time. One, it exposes what we couldn't see, right? Or maybe more clearly, it exposes sin, right? We shine, we shine the word of God in our lives. We're going to be drawn to confession, I hope, right? And to conviction of the things that are not pleasing to God. He's going to shine light on the sin. Another thing it does is it shines glory and exposes the glory of God, Right? Jesus is coming to say, I'm, I'm coming to restore you and I'm coming to shine a big, massive spotlight on who God is and his righteousness. Right? And who I am and my righteousness is Jesus. Um, I love my family so much that I packed them all up in a car and drove all the way to Manitoba for Christmas. And it was fun. And it was minus 30. And it, it was a lot of fun, actually. But I think part of the, the desire to just continue to do that every other year is that we grew up in a, in a traveling family. Um, growing up in Manitoba, I had a ton of, well, all of my mom's side was in Montana and Idaho, right? And uh, we got one Idahoan in here, Idahoan. Is that how you say it, Kyle? Yeah. Idahoan. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so we would pack. And that's, we would pack up, and that's a long drive. And I, I, I think back all the way to one of the first times that we ever did that, or at least the first time I remember it. And I'm just a little guy peeking out the window. My dad's just hammering down, driving through the night, like all good road trippers do, right? And I'm just trying to peek, and I eventually fall asleep. And I don't really know when the vast, beautiful landscape of the prairies turns into the weird mountains, right? I'm so glad I live in the mountains now. Um, But then I wake up and I look outside and the sun's out and what do I see? Lo and behold, the glory of the mountains. That is beautiful. First time seeing them ever. And I'm just stoked. And I think it was at that moment that my love for skiing started. I think that's what it was. Yeah, right there. (laughs) We had to travel a long way to ski in Manitoba. Anyways, that's a side note. Um, But I saw it, right? The light exposed that glory. And so likewise... Scripture exposes and, and, and shines a light on Jesus. And Jesus comes and says, I'm the light of the world. Right? I'm showing you the way. I'm showing you the glory of, of who I am. Follow me. Right? Because I am life. I'm sustaining. So Jesus says, <clears throat> So Jesus is eternal. He's from the beginning. Which means he is life. Jesus is made known to us. He restores us to God and to each other. He is light. And then fifthly, is that how you say that? Fifthly? Lastly, we look into, into chapter 2 in the first two verses and we understand that Jesus is our advocate, which is phenomenal. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Before we jump into the meat of that, there's this little phrase at the beginning, right? Little children. And later on in John, he kind of uses it as this term, uh, you know, young Christian. Like, listen carefully. You're new at this. You're just saved. Right here, it's like an endearing sort of introduction like these my my people those of you that are saved by God like I love you guys little children family like please pay attention here because what I'm about to tell you is super important don't sin ooh okay right so there's still a lot of a lot of weight on our obedience right we need to obey right we need to practice righteousness and we're going to be able to do that well by abiding in Jesus but because we're human If you do sin, don't distress, because who do we have? We have Jesus, the righteous, as our advocate. And I love this. I love, love, love this. Jesus, the righteous. It's his title, right? Hi, I'm Jesus, the righteous. This is who I am, right? He's proclaiming it. It'd be like me saying, hi, I'm Tyler, the sweaty one. Not so bad right now, but those of you that were playing basketball on Thursday, you didn't really want to guard me because I'm just, I'm a sopping mess, right? I can't change it. It's who I am, right? Aaron in the office, he calls me big man. Hey, big man. I know exactly who he's talking about. It's not Don. It's not Dave. 
It's not Andrew. It's the guy at the end of the hall who's just large, right? And as much as I may not like it, I can't change it because it's who I am, right? It's my, it's my title. So he says, hey, big man. It's like, I know Aaron's calling me. I better go see what he wants, <laughs> right? Jesus the righteous, like plaster it in the sky, on the wall, somewhere, Jesus the righteous, he comes and says, this is who I am. I'm holy. I'm righteous. And nothing's going to change that. Right? I love that that's in there. You can just meditate on that for hours. I think that's awesome. Right? So we're pointed to his holiness. And then we get to this word, right? Because he's righteous, we look at his advocacy, which stems from justification, right? And this, just, this idea of justification is that, you know, you're declared right before the judge, or in this case, the action of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. And upon the work of the cross and the resurrection, I can now stand before God, and Jesus says, Father, right? Tyler, don't look at him as Tyler the sinner. When you look at him, you're going to see me. You're going to see Christ because I am declaring him righteous. It's like, I don't deserve that. I deserve death, eternal separation from God. Instead, we get his righteousness. We get that title, right? We don't deserve it. And it's not us. It's it's him in us. So advocacy, person who pleads on someone else's behalf. So he's done it. He's declared me righteous. And then the second part of this, if you do sin, you have a advocate. Well, guess what? Tyler continues to sin. Oh, remember what I did for him? It's all good. Carry on. I carry on. I start doing things in my own strength, and I sin again. Father, remember what I did for him? It's all good. Carry on. Right? He continues to go to bat. Right? I used this illustration uh, talking to the youth the other day, and I think it worked a little bit better with the junior youth. So imagine you're in your, in your classroom, and you do something wrong, right? And when your teacher, if you're in elementary, might not just send you to the principal, but actually take you. Now imagine this. Your teacher takes you to the principal's office, knocks on the door. You're about to get in trouble. You're about to go home or whatever the consequence is. And your teacher says, don't worry. I'm just going to sit here all day in his place. It's like, ooh, that's awesome. Right? And not just the once, but for the rest of the year, your teacher's actually just going to stay in the principal's office for you. I would have loved that. I spent some time there, I tell you. Sinful little Tyler. (laughs) Right? And the kids love that. But in, in a similar way, right? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. He is our advocate, saying, I paid for that. He's good. I got it. By the propitiation of our sins, the covering up of, the atonement of, right? He shed his blood for us, right? We're justified. He's our advocate because he covered it up with his blood, right? It's gone. No more. So how do we pull it all together? How do we use it? How do we uh, apply it to our lives? There's been a a few sort of pit stops here of application, but there's one word that comes to mind, and it's abide, right? If you haven't clued in yet. He's life-giving. He's restoring. He's made himself known by coming to this world to, to put into plan the action of redemption. He is our advocate, Right? In him, we get his righteousness. You kind of take that as a, as a package and say, like, do you want that? <laughs> yeah, I want that. That's awesome. Right? That's awesome. That's the free gift. We need to abide in it. Right? We need to be like that, like that fish, just kind of camping out all day long, right? At the stream. Or in Jeremiah, that, that branch, that's, its roots just go deep. Right? And are directly fed by the stream that runs through the dried up land. Right? But in that stream, there's life. Like that beetle that climbs to the top of that sand dune every single day, mind you, to stick itself in the air and catch the mist. Right? Even though there's danger there. Are we abiding? True, death defeating, sin forgiving, relationship restoring. Trial enduring, because we know we have those trials. Grace and mercy infused life is only found in Jesus Christ. It's only found. And it's put there because he loves us. Right? And that just kind of caps it all off. 
And again, another strong theme through 1 John. Jesus is love. He loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't put the plan into action. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't sit at the right hand of the Father every single time we screw up and say, it's good, I got it. I paid for it on the cross. I rose again so that Tyler could have life, so you guys could have life. 